You tell me when we start. <laughs> Maybe we can say together. Hello, everybody. Yes. Hello. And uh, your wife. Hello, Hello everybody. everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Hi. Yes, from Pi Ladies Munich, I'm Laisa and I'm Andrea. We're so glad. Is it, is it any better? Is it any better? now? Can you hear us better? They cannot hear. Oh my god, you're not so good. Alright. They won't dispatch me. Yeah. So sorry for that. Thank you so much for your patience. You know, this is well. You cannot hear us so. One minute, one minute. Yeah. One minute, just a moment, please. Okay. So we have a bit of. So you hear us now? So Lisa is the queen of the bugging. <laughs> Lisa is the queen of the bugging. <laughs> That's right. We're super glad to have you today, Lisa. So um, we're gonna start with a presentation now, and we'll later have some time for questions. I think we need to. I think we are listening to someone typing, right? Oh, all right. Someone is calling they, right they now. They can't hear Lisa right now. They cannot hear Lisa. Why? Can you hear us now? So just, I think someone is typing. Is it you, Sarah? Um, um, yeah, that's right. You can, I mean, let us just give us a minute. Can please someone from the public get us the thumbs up that you can hear Lisa right now so that we can then start a presentation. We just want to make sure that you get the same that we are having at home. They can hear us, not us. I can only hear us where I am with myself or not. Hello, All right. So we just need to make sure that everybody can hear Lisa. Because people can hear Lisa.
Okay, it should work now. Uh, Lisa, can you tell something, please? So please just let us know if you can hear me. Yes. All right. Oh, we're so sorry. Thank you so much for um, going through this with us. We're just having some audio trouble. All right, so I guess now I will, um, I can also introduce Lisa to you all. She is the Dovering Queen, as just Lisa uh, said before. She is work, uh, working for Pride Charm IDE at Jet Brains, and today she will tell us about the Python debugger as soon as we can hear her. And she is tuning in from St. Petersburg. So today is really um, one one round around the world for us, right? From Brazil to Russia. <laughs> in, the, in the middle of Germany. <laughs> right, okay. All right. So, Lisa, can you try again to say something, yeah. please? Yeah. Yeah. Hello. I'm Elizabeth Feshkova. I can't hear you. Can you hear me? I don't know if people can hear you. Can you hear Lisa? I'm sorry. It works? And that works? All right. Lisa, the stage is yours. Thank you so much. Okay. Yes, please. <laughs> Local pilot is No. <laughs> what? What can they say? To us now, right? no. So, no. we're gonna interrupt you and then put you on the phone side and you can start Skype from your side because right. we don't know where is the problem. All right, so everybody, we're so sorry. Skype is um, not on our side today, so what we're gonna do is we need a two minute break for to solve this technicality. We're gonna restart from our side, from his side, and find the bug. So we started this uh, talk about the bug, <laughs> trying to find the bug. <laughs> we are right. starting the bug. That's right. So thank you so much for your patience and see you so in a minute. Right.
Okay. Ah, all right, there. <laughs> I was just about uh, writing to you about how I miss Boosted Boris right now to at least like have that drums um, behind my jokes. <laughs> So thank you so much, uh, so much for sticking here with us and going through all these audio technicalities. Um, it doesn't work now. Are you hearing? Are you able to hear us? Please give us some feedback. Can you hear Lisa? Hello, I'm Lisa. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? I hear your screen. All right, they are able to hear us. Thank you so much, uh, you so Victor much. and Music Moose. <laughs> so thank you so much. We're now you're able to hear us. Okay, that's start. great. <laughs> Let me introduce Lisa for the. Time. So, all right, so the third time is the best time, I guess. All right, so please welcome everyone, Lisa, the queen of Python debugging, and she will be telling us today about Python debugging. She is um, a developer for PyCharm IDE at JetBrains. So, bit of applause for Lisa, please, everyone. <laughs> Hello. So, I starting my presentation. Can you hear my screen or see my screen and hear my voice? <laughs> yes. All right. Cool. Now we see your so screen then, and we hear your voice. We're good to go. Thank you. Yeah, Lisa. that's great. Thank you. Thank you very much. So let's finally talk about Python visual debuggers. Um, as we've already said today, I'm software developer at JetBrains. I'm living in the Russian city, St. Petersburg, and we even have a local PyLadies community here. 
Also, St. Petersburg is a really beautiful city. So if you have a chance, please come and visit it. <laughs> I hope one day borders will be open again and we'll meet in person all together. <laughs> But today, let's return to Python, Python development, and of course, uh, we always write code with bugs. And two most popular ways uh, to uh, find uh, bugs uh, in your code is to... Sorry? Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, so the most popular way to... Uh, uh, run uh, to find bugs in your program is to either uh, use print statements or to use common line debugger like for example PDB. Print statements are great because they work everywhere uh, and you can just print everything in your code but they modify your source code and not very convenient because you have to rerun your program many many times if you want to add some additional information. Common line debuggers like PDB are more useful than print statements because there is no need to modify your source code. But at the same time, you need to remember commands, learn them by heart, what you should type if you want to add breakpoint, what, what you should type if you want, I don't know, execute some stepping command. And well, it's also not very convenient. And there is a separate uh, class of tools visual debuggers, which allow you to debug your program without code modification, without remembering some comments, because you can just click buttons, start debug session, and execute your program line by line, and um, check variables values, and do a lot of some other stuff. So today, uh, uh, we're, we're going to talk about debugging, so I decided to put the beautiful picture of Ladybug here. Uh, so today we will learn how Python debuggers work, uh, which problems can appear if you decide to uh, develop your own debugger. Uh, we'll discuss such problems like performance or parallel execution. Uh, also we will learn which types of files you can debug, not only Python types. And if we have time, we even have a short live demo inside PyTor. So let's start and uh, learn how Python debuggers work. Um, most Python debuggers are based on tracing function. Uh, you can define tracing function and uh, set it to the current frame with sys.setTrace built-in function. Tracing function takes three arguments, frame, event, and arc. Frame object represents a current scope of the program. Event is a string which represents event which happened in your program. And arc is argument of this event. So let's see how uh, our very simple tracing function uh, uh, here. It just prints line number and event which happened on this line. And let's see how it works on this very simple example. So here's function grid neighbors, we just iterates over lists of two elements and just print some strings there. We find our trace function, set it, and called our function grid neighbors. What happens in the program? When we called our function, our, fun uh, our tracing function prints one, one call. That means that one call happened on the line one. Then uh, event line happens on the line two because uh, Python interpreter uh, executed line two. After that, it executed lines three and four, and output high Mars appears because uh, we are inside loop. After that, uh, events line uh, appear executed on the line three and four again, and output high Venus appears in our program output. And after that, interpreter executes uh, line five. So we receive event line on the line five and event return uh, because interpreter leaving current function. So the event return happens in our program. Great. Um, so how can we use this tracing function to implement our debugger? First of all, for our debugger, we want to implement breakpoints. It's just a point uh, where user put it in somewhere in their code, and that means that debugger should stop in this place. 
on this file in this line number. Uh, the great thing is that a frame object has uh, information about current line number, where is execution located, and current file name, so which where some event is happened. And breakpoint also has file and line number. And that means that uh, current line number in frame object equals breakpoint line number, and current file name in frame equals breakpoint file name. That means that our execution process reached the exact place of this breakpoint, and we should suspend our program. Again, if we want to implement stepping, uh, we should do something very similar. Uh, we, inside our tracing function, we receive different events, and we just can analyze them and understand, okay, user pressed step into, uh, we have a call event, that means that we need to uh, go through this function. Or if it's step over, we should skip call event and uh, step at the next line event, or after the next return event. So it works pretty simple, and now we understand how it works. But uh, if you decide to implement your own Python debugger, uh, some problems can appear in it. And the first important, the most important maybe problem is debugger performance. Uh, why people usually doesn't, don't like running debuggers? Because debuggers on every program uh, make execution almost 30 times slower. Why it happens? Uh, as you remember, in the first example, we defined our tracing function, uh, which was executed on every, every event which happens in our program. And our tracing function was pretty simple. It was just one print statement, so nothing slow here. Uh, but what if uh, we are defining our tracing function for some really uh, large... Uh, function, not really large. So uh, the function which does a lot of computations. For example, this function is just uh, calculating a sum of numbers from 0 to uh, the seventh uh, power of 10. What happens here? Uh, if we define even very simple tracing function, it will be executed many, many times. You can see because uh, we will receive a lot of line events on the lines 3 and 4. And what does it mean? That means that if our program, if it took about one second to execute our program without tracing function at all, it takes almost seven seconds to execute it with tracing function. And it's already about 20 seconds uh, if we have some breakpoints. So if uh, our, we have not just a empty tracing function, but a tracing function which iterates, for example, through three breakpoints, we, uh, it, uh, this function will be executed uh, for 20 seconds. So we can see the program has become 25 times slower. And this is very significant if you do some computations or some complicated things. So what can we do here? Uh, which, which problem we have? The problem is that tra uh, we call tracing function too often. We call it in every line and it takes some time, of course. Uh, how can we solve it? The solution appeared in Python 3.6 because in Python 3.6, a new frame evaluation API appeared. It was introduced in PEP 523. It introduces a frame evaluation function. This function handles evaluation of frames and adds, uh, this PEP also adds a new field to code object. What, what does it mean, this frame evaluation function? Um, uh, how can it help us to solve our problem? Uh, as you remember, we had a problem that tracing function was called on every line and made our program much, much slower. Let's try to replace this tracing function with frame evaluation function. How can we do it? Frame evaluation function is being executed uh, while entering a frame. And uh, it, of course, has access to this frame and its code object. That means that, for example, here, we want to implement breakpoint, uh, so the program will stop on this line number three. How can we do it? Uh, if we want to set breakpoint here, it means that uh, on the line three, in fact, between lines two and three, we want to call some function called breakpoint, 
And uh, this function will wait in infinite loop uh, for some com for user's comment. So when the program is suspended, that means that execution is uh, waiting in infinite loop and waits for a next user comment. How can we do it? And when we uh, insert this function here, that means that we implemented our breakpoint. How can we do it with frame evaluation? We can. Uh, we have access to a frame object. We have access to a code object. That means that we can do bytecode modification and insert a code of the breakpoint fun function right into the place where we want to have this breakpoint. So before entering the frame, uh, if we already know the location of this breakpoint, we can just take a uh, bytecode of this breakpoint function and insert it into code object and continue execution. So, uh, we, of course, we'll update our arguments and offsets, but it's not very difficult. It's quite the sequence of comments in, in bytecode, and it can be modified. So now, when we execute, uh, as, as you remember, uh, a running program with tracing function sometimes can could be 25 times slower than executing it without tracing function. But with frame evaluation function, it's almost as fun, uh, as fast, because we just do it once. We know information about breakpoints. We inserted our function. It's just called once, and that's it. So there is no need to trace every every event in our program. So uh, our frame evaluation function is available since Python 3.6, and it uh, the first time it was implemented in PyCharm community by me. I was the person who implemented it, and it helped uh, to make debugger much faster. But there is important note uh, that uh, uh, if we want to support stepping comments, we still need to use tracing function. So we can't uh, remove tracing function from debugger and use frame evaluation function instead. Because for tracing function, uh, we, uh, we don't know uh, the exact place where we're going to stop before user comments. And users usually execute stepping comments only when execution is already inside frame. Uh, we can't call our frame evaluation function uh, where when execution is inside frame, we can call it only when execution in the frame hasn't been started yet. So currently debugger uses both frame evaluation function for breakpoints and tracing function for stepping comments. Great, but performance isn't the only problem which happens in debugger. The second problem is parallel execution. Um, parallel, there are three ways to execute tasks in parallel in Python. There are threads, asynchronous tasks, and processes. Um, if you want to debug threads, uh, you already know that in debugger we use frame evaluation function for breakpoints and tracing function for stepping. So if I want to debug threads, uh, uh, everything is quite easy here because uh, tracing function already supports debugging of new threads uh, because there is function threading dot set trace. Uh, so it will add your custom tracing function for to every new thread started with the help of threading module. And frame evaluation function works with all threads by design, so there is no need to do it. Here, we just get everything out of the box. Okay, debugging for threads is solved. Uh, asynchronous tasks. Also, there is no any problems here because um, asynchronous tasks are running in the same process uh, and in the same thread. And again, there is no need to add anything. Once we defined tracing function or frame evaluation function, they are available for every asynchronous task in the same process. But uh, as you remember, there is the third way to run tasks in parallel, creation new process. Um, how, uh, when we want to debug new processes, we need to set tracing and frame evaluation function to this newly created process. So we need to detect new process creation. So because at this moment we can define 
uh, our tracing for evaluation function and our debugger will work in new processes again. Uh, and breakpoints in these new processes will also work. How can we detect this process creation? With monkey budget. Python is dynamically typed language, dynamic language, so we can use this powerful, but at the same time, rather dangerous tool. Be very careful if you decide to use it, because monkey patching is a dynamic modification of some objects, classes, or modules at runtime. How it works? For example, we can patch function fork. How can we do it? First of all, we save a function original function fork to the variable original, so the original function is saved here. After that, we define function patched fork, which does the following. It executes the original function, so creates a process, then checks the value which was returned from original fork. If a uh, uh, function returned zero, that means that we are in child process, and we can do something like print some statement to the output. Uh, and after that, we assign new our function, uh, set it uh, as fork attribute in the module OS. So what it means, now if someone call os.fork in their code, it will call not the original fork function, but our patched version of the fork function. And if we call os.fork function, uh, the string inside child process will appear because it called our patched version. And now, since we still want to implement debugger, what can we do? We replace this uh, print statements with our sys.setTrace function. So uh, it will help us to define tracing function in a child process. And that's how debugging in new processes will work. Great, so we've fixed uh, uh, issues with parallel execution with our debugger, supported it for threads, asynchronous tasks, and even processes where we used monkey patching. Great. Uh, but there are also other uh, file types where you can write Python code. It's not just .py files. For example, uh, there are template languages so you can uh, write Python code right inside HTML files. There are Django templates or Jinja2 templates. Uh, also, there are Jupyter notebooks. Uh, again, you can write Python code, but uh, it will be inside a cell uh, inside your Jupyter notebook, uh, inside a file with ipynb extension. And uh, the cool thing is that uh, you can debug uh, this Python code inside PyCharm as well. Uh, recently, we've added support for Jupyter Notebooks in PyCharm. It looks like this. So on the left, you can see the source code, and on the, on the right side, you can see preview. And um, uh, you can work uh, with Jupyter cells as if they are located in the same Python editor. But in fact, in inside, it's still the same Jupyter Notebook. You can see it has IPNB extension here, and uh, it was added yeah, more, more than almost, well, more, more than a year ago. Uh, it shows a custom presentation for Jupyter Notebooks. And the most interesting for us today is that you can debug Jupyter cells right inside your application, right inside PyCharm. So that's really cool because, because debugger can help you define bug not only in your Python code, but also in Jupyter Notebooks or a uh, web application like uh, some templates, and that's really great. And now, if we have some time, I'm going to show you some short live demo. Of course, it's said by Jar. Um, I hope you still can see my screen. If you don't, yeah, but yeah, that's great. So, how can you start debug session in PyCharm? It's just very simple. You can just put debug, put breakpoint here. Uh, execute press when right click debug and uh, PyCharm starts a debugging session right inside your 
like you, there is no need to modify your code like you do it with print statements. There is no need to uh, remember any commands like you do it with PDB. You just click and well, it's a bit slow because I have well, Skype, which is running. Yeah, so we are stopped at this breakpoint. What can we see here? Here are variables which are available in this place. Uh, stack frames, which shows us uh, where, uh, how can we get to this program, to this place in our program, and what can we do? Okay, we talked a lot about stepping today, so let's execute step over. Okay, so we execute our program line by line, and you can see that variables values are updated here, and we can uh, check, for example, elements of the list. Or we can, for example, evaluate expression. Example here, planets. Just evaluate, and we can see this variable. We can inspect its state. If I have more or some different variables, we can start an interactive uh, console session. So again, here we can just okay. Let's execute planets, and it prints. And you can execute a lot of different expressions with completion. So again, if you use PDB, you need to uh, write your uh, expression every time. There is no code completion, which helps you to uh, check which var variables are available in the current scope. And in Visual Debugger, it, it just works out of the box, so there is no need to configure anything, just, just click buttons. Okay, uh, so we are iterating over different, well, places here uh, over list elements. Let's try to step into some function. And what happens here? OK, here uh, PyCharm suggests us to step into uh, functions because we have two function calls in the same line. And uh, PyCharm allows us to uh, select which function we want to step in. OK, let's go here. Yeah, and we stepped into this function definition and we can go here and again return and do a lot of stuff. Uh, well, uh, but what if we, okay, we have this list of planets, it's quite big and we want to stop at Jupiter. Uh, not many people know that you can define condition for your breakpoint. So here you can just right click and here you can define condition. So you can OK, let's better put it here. Uh, so what what it means that that means that okay, planet name, uh, this uh, breakpoint will be suspended if and only if uh, the condition is true. If condition is false, it will continue execution and ignore this breakpoint. So we can see now we can skip all the planets uh, and uh, stop only at Jupiter. Let's try to do it. We defined condition, press resume. And what's going on? We can see output here. Yeah, we are iterating our planets. And yes, our debugger is suspended. And we can see planet name is Jupiter. So our breakpoint was suspended uh, only here where, uh, where our condition is true. And this is very useful because, for example, if you need to iterate over very, very big collection or some really big piece of code, um, you can just quickly define condition and use it the way you need it. This is very cool feature and uh, this you can use. And as I've told you during my presentation, uh, we've implemented debugger for Jupyter Notebooks. Let's just quickly show it. I think we have two or more minutes. So this is our Jupyter Notebooks. Here we can see cells on the left, we can execute it. Yeah, and PyCharm will start Jupyter server for you right here. Let's wait for a moment. Yeah, and shows you variables defined in the current kernel. Okay, let's go next. Here, again, you can just put breakpoint inside your Jupyter cell and execute debug instead of run. And what happens here? Again, we are starting a debugger session and we are suspended here and we again can see variable values. And we even can step into function defined in this 
well, the cell, or we even can step into function defined in other cell. So again, here we can debug and one moment and we can step into. And again, you can see we stepped into function. It was defined in another cell, but we still were able to step into it. And that is really great. And this is how it works. So if you do some uh, maybe data science or computation tasks and work with Jupyter notebooks, um, it might be useful to use Jupyter debugger to find bugs in your code or to understand your how your program works. Okay, so let's go back to my presentation. Um, so what we've learned today. Today we've learned how Python debuggers work, that they are based on tracing function and frame relations function. Uh, we've learned how debuggers handle parallel execution in Python. So your breakpoints will work not only in the current thread, current process, but also in other threads, other processes and asynchronous tasks. And also we've learned that uh, it's possible to debug not only Python files, uh, but also other file types, including Jupyter Notebooks. And uh, the most important thing I want you to remember today uh, is that uh, Python visual debuggers are really cool. They are really powerful tool which can make, make you become much more productive because they just usually work out of the box and there is no need to remember anything or modify source code. They, they just works and they can help you to find your box really quickly. So if you're not using visual debuggers yet, please consider it. They exist in almost in any I Python IDE nowadays, but the best one, of course, is inside PyCharm <laughs> because I'm working on it. Yeah. So thank you very much for uh, listening to me today. Uh, here are my contacts, my Twitter, and I think I am ready to answer your questions if we have time. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. All right. So thank you very much, uh, Lisa, for that smooth presentation. I really hope um, our demos, uh, like our show, would run as smoothly as your demo did. PVD <laughs> saved my neck so many times so many hours. So I'm very glad to finally also see something I can click on on PyCharm. That's just great. Thank you so much. So yeah. first of all, let's go to the public for some questions. Yeah, let's see. Let's see what we have there. All right. So Jürgen says, great talk. Thank you for showing how the buggers really work. And many claps for you. So many claps for for you from us as well. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. That's great. So I have a question. I know you just passed from yeah. this subject of mocking patch, but when is like mocking patching too much? Like when you're patching things too much and you end up like hiding the real uh, yeah, yeah, that, that's why um, I said it during my presentation. Monkey patching is a powerful tool, but at the same time, it's a dangerous tool. So yeah, when you, in fact, you uh, silently modify some code and it works the different way and you can't understand it from source code uh, or when you're, well, for example, I don't know, using some library that this library silently modifies your code. So that's why you should use it really careful in debugger, well, uh, debugger itself, it modifies your code execution a bit, of course. So yeah, monkey patching is modifies it a bit uh, in addition to it. So it's okay, but be very careful when you're using it in production or somewhere else. In fact, uh, not only debuggers defy your code in runtime, for example, I don't tools like PyTest, they also do a lot of uh, mocking for objects and uh, replacing some things in runtime, I don't know, to show you beautiful, I don't know, error messages or tracebacks or other stuff. So it's, well, powerful, but be very careful when you decide to use it. Yeah. Thank All you right. for the question. Thank you so much. So we're getting lots of shout outs for you. Um, you also converted some people today to PyCharm, as I'm seeing right now. You're going to change yes. ASAP. 
um, yeah, I guess <laughs> we learned to handle monkey python with care. So don't turn your bug hunt into a monkey hunt, I guess. <laughs> I also have a question. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so I also have a question for you, and it's very basic. Yep. So you showed us so many different um, tools today, or like so many features today of the debugger and how how to use it properly. So what I'm asking myself is, is this already all included in the PyCharm when you're using it, or do you need to install any add-ons, or how does, does that work? How is that? Uh, no, the, the coolest thing about PyCharm is that everything works out of the box. So our debugger is available at PyCharm. There is no need to install anything. Uh, the only difference is that there are two editions of PyCharm, PyCharm Community Edition, which is free and open source, and PyCharm Professional Edition. It's a paid version, but it has some additional functionality. And uh -huh. debugger, our debugger, yeah, is part of both of these editions. So if you want to debug usual Python files, uh, community edition is enough. You can just, again, uh, debugger is already there, so you can put breakpoints, start debug session, execute stepping commands, everything is there. Yeah, but support for uh, other file types, which I showed you today, like templates or Jupyter notebooks, is available only in PyCharm Professional. Yeah. All right. And also Thank you so remote, much. Remote things are oh. also part of PyCharm Professional. Yeah. But if you work locally and only with Python files, PyCharm community will be enough for you. So you can give it a try <laughs> right now. If you say please a name, you get the PyCharm professional. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, uh, Lisa, sorry, um, I have um, some things to ask you. Could you please just stop uh, sharing your slides now? Yeah, yeah, sure. All right. Thank you so much. Oops. All right. Great. Yeah. Uh, that's Thank very you. nice. So now we're also able to see you uh, smiling and reacting hey. to all of our <laughs> commenters. Yeah, so we're yeah very happy to see you again. <laughs> all right, so <laughs> thank you so much. This has been really cool. Let's see if there's anything else from the public. All right, I see um, no more than like lots of claps and people very happy to see you thank here you today so with us. I hope maybe one time you can also teach us more about using PyCharm with the That's right. <laughs> yeah, me too. I hope you ha we can have you someday also in Munich and have uh, and share a beer with you and yeah. to, or a pretzel yeah, like. <laughs> yeah, that right, would like, be great. Or a pretzel. <laughs> uh, yeah, depending on what you're up to. <laughs> All right, that's really cool. So what we're gonna do next is we're gonna go in a five minute break. But before that, I don't know if I have done this enough. My answer to that is no. I just wanna really shout out to Anton who has really been amazing and just turning this show into what it, it's, it is right now. So shout out to Anton, please. Anton, come <laughs> Woo! Yeah. Thank you so much. That's easy. Thank you. <laughs> That's all, thanks. <laughs> no, all right, so thank you so much. And yeah, then, um, I don't know, what do you say, Liz, uh, Laisa? Do you think we need a five minutes or can we continue? We're, uh, we're quite... I think two minutes, one minute, right? Like, to be more and then... <laughs> All right. So okay. With Luciano. All right. So what is that waiting for you after the break? Uh, we're going to be talking with Luciano Ramallo, uh, also the author of this book. See, I think many people know. So stay there, stay tuned. All right, see you in one minute. Thank you so much. Bye. <laughs> well, <laughs> see you. In <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for joining right now. If you want to stay this minute with us, it's totally okay, totally good for you. Yeah, we can. We're very happy to have Where you here. Where are you from right now? Yeah, we know Where this is located? a exactly. We know this is a, a worldwide trip today, uh, tonight, in this evening. We're going like from Russia to Brazil through Munich. So, um, let us know where are you joining from today. Today, maybe it's lunchtime for you. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, so I see some comments, some other people from Munich. Maria, hello, and yes, Lisa, come to Munich. <laughs> I would be really happy. Yeah. 
that's great. <laughs> awesome. So you admit us a little bit skeptical about um, the beer. <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> I am just very happy. This helped us cool down. <laughs> oh, so there's one, someone joining us from India. Hello there. We're so happy to hear you. And also from Berlin. Hello, Anastasia. So nice to have you, uh, have you with us today. All right. That's really cool. So, is that one minute? <laughs> I guess that's one minute. Let's start. Great. Okay. So, I can't wait um, to hear who's next. You already told us a little bit. So, please, Lisa, do you, uh, Lisa, do you care to tell us a little bit more about the great author of Fluent Python? If you're a beginner and you want to uh, get fluent in Python, this is the way. You came to the right place. All right. So. <laughs> Hello, and Luciano. I'm very happy that he could join us. He's the author of the Fluent Python. He's right now working in the next edition of the book. Maybe he can also give a little update for us. He's right now in São Paulo. Uh, let's welcome him. Woo! Hello, Luciano. So glad to have you. How are Hello, you? Thank you. I am fine. Thank you very much for having me. I'm super happy to be here. Last That's year, great. Uh, yeah, last year I went to, to Berlin and I had a great time there. I loved meeting people from different communities, from the Python community, from the Go community in Berlin. And also last year I was in Shanghai where I met Lisa, which is great. It's great. Place. Oh, wow. So I we're all China. connected over here. Yes. It's, it's kind of parallel yes. universe now. <laughs> but it's all meeting tonight <laughs> here, right? So we're so glad to have you. We have the thumbs up for from the public, from the from Anton and from the stream, so everyone is able to hear you. And everyone We're very loves happy. The book, Luciano. That's right. <laughs> so, okay, so we're ready, I guess, to learn more about what Luciano has to tell us tonight. Can you talk about Python? Okay, let's get started. All um, right, so. And, uh, he just told us see. that he was it's... 14. So, can you, can you see the slides? Yes, uh, we're good for you to share your slides. Thank you so much. I, I, I am sharing. Can you see it All right. or not? Um, one moment, please. Can we see the slides? Yeah. We can see the slides. Perfect. All right. So, the stage is yours. Thank you so much, Luciano. Oh. Woo! Okay. Thank you so much. So, uh, this is... Uh, uh, one of the hardest parts for me writing the second edition of Fluent Python is because of this new thing of the type hints. And so uh, my message to you is just take it easy with type hints, okay? And I'm going to explain why. But let's go. So uh, I, 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 I've been talking about type hints and writing up and you know, tweeting about it sometimes. And the other, about a month ago, I, I, I wrote that I, I was finding my peace with type hints. And then Raymond Hettinger, you know, this famous, famous core contributor of Python and instructor, he sent this tweet saying that, uh, you know, most public talks seem to be given by people who, whose entire job is to make everyone in the organization use typing. And I watched in preparation for my book about eight, at least eight different talks on YouTube from PyCon and other conferences and meetups about uh, typing. And I think Raymond is right. I mean, all of the talks that I have seen are of people that are super typing evangelists. You know, there are people that are actually paid a salary to promote type hints in their company. And I think that introduces a little bit of a bias. And that's so my idea today is to talk about the pros and cons of type hints. Okay. So just to, uh, uh, as a very brief introduction. So the idea was introdu introduced in PEP 484 that's in 2015, and 
the idea is that you are able to use a syntax like in those red uh, parts of the code here, where you annotate, uh, the, for instance, the function arguments and the return type of the function. Okay? And that uh, is supported by a module in the standard library called the typing module that appeared in Python 3.5. And it's more, this whole thing is mostly about supporting external tools. Like, for instance, IDEs like PyCharm are able to use those, those type things to help with better autocompletion, better refactoring, and so on. And also, you can run type checkers like MyPy, uh, PyTypes, and there are several others. There's about four or five different type checkers, open source, that I know about that you can use uh, to, to verify your code like you do with automated testing, okay? Now, it's very important for us to understand uh, this idea that we have, Python has always been a dynamically typed language, right? Where type checks only happen at one time. And Python is not alone. This is like that, has been since the beginning in the 50s, small talk, JavaScript, Ruby, Clojure, Elixir are all examples of new and not so new languages that are dynamically typed, okay? And then, of course, there are the statically typed languages like C, C++, Pascal, Java, C Sharp, Haskell, Rust, Kotlin, there's uh, lots of them. And uh, of course, there are advantages and disadvantages, right? So, so dynamically typed languages are usually easier to learn because you don't need to learn the formality of the type system. And they are also enable a kind of exploratory style of coding that is very good, for instance, when you are experimenting, when you are a data scientist, for instance, or when you are just learning to program it's good to be able to uh, uh, learn in practice what, what types are. You, with, a type, with a statically typed language, you're forced to learn about types, type theory, before you start using it, right? Because you have to write those annotations. But Python now, with type hints, joins a third group of languages, which are the languages that have gradual typing. And this is a new thing, and it's very interesting because when Guido started thinking about, uh, uh, Guido said in a, in, a, in a talk that for about 20 years, he, he wanted to have some mechanism for type annotations in Python. And it's good that he waited because the idea of gradual typing didn't exist 20 years ago. Gradual typing was something that appeared in the literature, apparently around 2006. And it's the, it's a, the idea of a, of a hybrid approach that appeared in languages like ActionScript, Hack, which is a PHP dialect that uh, Facebook created and used, the Dart language that is part of the Flutter SDK that Google is promoting, TypeScript is the most famous gradual type language. And those languages, uh, they are languages that you can just use them as a dynamic language. You don't ever have to write a type hint, but they allow you to write type hints. And in order for a language to work in this hybrid mode, there is, was, there was an, an, an innovation that was very important, that was the any type. I'm gonna show an example of the any type, okay? So the, but anyway, without this insight of the any type, it, gradual typing is not possible. And this is this insight is not simple. I'm, I'm gonna show you a few examples, okay? So this is this was the first time that I was happy about typings. Because my first reaction to typings were I was not very happy. I liked Python very I like Python very much, I still like Python very much, and I like the fact that it is a dynamic language, a dynamically typed language. So my first reaction to type hints was I didn't like that, the whole idea. 
But then I started to experiment. And one day I was writing an example. Uh, and actually I was porting an example from a, a, a book that had Ruby examples. And it was like the, it was the eight queens problem. Uh, and this is one part of the example. And I was having a bug. I, I had a bug in this example that I, it was difficult for me to, to discover because the algorithm is complicated. And so I started adding typing. So if you, if you look at line 32 in this example, there is just one typing, which is the return type. Okay? And that's very important to understand. You don't need to annotate everything. You don't need to annotate all the methods, all the functions. You don't even need to annotate all the arguments of a function or put a return type. If you don't put any annotation in a function, the type checker will usually ignore it. Okay? But if you put any annotation, whatever, a single annotation, like I did in line 32, I just put, this function returns a bool. This was enough for my pie to immediately show me what the problem was. The problem was on line 37, because I had ported this code from Ruby, and in Ruby, the last expression in a function is the value of the function, the return value of the function. But in Python, it doesn't work like that. You have to actually use the return statement, right? But I forgot that I didn't put the return statement. So what was happening in this function was if the if was true on line 34, then the function returned true on line 35. But if the if was not uh, true, it was supposed to return the result of the, that method call, the can attack method call. But because I forgot the return, it was always this function, in this case, was returning none, which sometimes worked because none is considered false, but sometimes it didn't. So it was a difficult bug because it was an intermittent bug. It, ha it happened in some cases, it did happen in other cases. But anyway, as soon as I wrote that single annotation returns bool on line 32 and run my pi, it immediately showed me that the line, this function was missing a return statement. So that was, uh, that was, uh, I, I felt happy about that. So that was the first time that I felt personally a benefit. Okay. Uh, not, now here's another example. I had, I, I, I was running last year a workshop about, uh, Programming languages at Garoa Hacker Club, a hackerspace that we have in Sao Paulo. And we were implementing an interpreter for this simple language that I called Sub Pascal, which is a Pascal like language with a Lisp syntax because Lisp is easy to parse. And here, for instance, you can see a few things about type things. In order to use type hints today, you need to import the types from the typing module. You see, for instance, the arrow is pointing at a list with an uppercase, uppercase L. So if you want to say that something is a list in your code, you can't use the lowercase list yet. You will be able to in Python 3.9, but not today. So you have to import some types there, okay? And uh, the other thing that I want to talk about is on line nine, I define a type called atom, which is a union of a string and an int. So what I'm saying is, in my parser, an atom may be a string or it may be an integer, okay? The next line, I define an expression as a union of an atom and a list. An expression can be just an atom or it can be a list. But actually, this annotation is not what I wanted to write. What I wanted to write was that an, exp uh, an expression is a union of an atom and an atom followed by an expression. A list composed of an atom and, and an expression. It would be a recursive definition, right? Because, you know, 
if you look at the syntax here, uh, in this example with the parentheses, you, you see uh, the number zero is an atom, is also an expression, but uh, minus n1 is an expression with a minus n and 1. So it's a recursive structure, and I cannot express that using type names to do. Uh, people complain about that a lot, for instance, because it's not possible to, to express JSON structures in type hints today, because a JSON structure is a recursive structure, right? Anyway, so there are limits to what you can express in type hints. Type hints are not as expressive as Python itself, okay? I'm going to kind of... Uh, rush through the data classes. Data class is one example of the use of, of type hints and also typing name and tuple. Uh, so for instance, this slide here shows typing name and tuple. If you see lines five and six, they are variable declarations and they are using inside the declaration of a name and tuple to say this name and tuple has these two instance attributes, lot and home. Hmm. Data classes use a similar syntax. So these are new things that, that uh, take advantage of the type hint syntax. This is another example of a type hint with, uh, with, a, uh, with a, a data class with several fields. And on line nine of this example, you can see that I say creators is a list of string. So the, the square brackets are used for generic types, like the angular brackets in Java. Here, in Python, we use square brackets. So I'm saying creators is a list of strings. Okay. Anyway, there's a lot of stuff in type things. For instance, there is this idea of overloads, because it turns out that uh, some functions in Python uh, Maybe there's a noise because somebody started to use it. a saw. One second. Okay, the neighbor was using a saw. Anyway, so if you look at this uh, example here, if you, in Python we have the, the built in sum function, right? Okay, but the problem is. How do you define the return type of the sum? It depends on what the input types are, right? Uh, <clears throat> for instance, so in order to address this problem that sometimes the return type of a function depends on the type of the arguments or the presence or absence of certain arguments, so type uh, the typing module has this overload decorator that you can use, and then you can make a declaration like that. So, first of all, on the bullet number two, I'm showing that you have to declare the type variables that you're going to use in the generics. Other languages like TypeScript in Java, you don't need to declare the type variables, but in Python, we need to do that because the by default, Python doesn't understand a symbol unless you declare it, right? There's no special syntax for typing in Python. So this T, you know, use the T variable uh, in the first overload there. I have to declare the T somehow. And so that's kind of a hack that we have to use in Python. We will use the type var to say, okay, I have a type var T and I have a type var S. And then uh, the first overload says that if the sum function gets an iterable of t, then the return type is a union of t and integer. So if, it, if the sum gets an iterable of floats, the return type will be a union of float and int. Why is that union? Because uh, if the iterable is empty, 
then the sum function returns zero by default. And zero is an integer. Right? Now, if the iterable is not empty and it's an iterable of floats, then the, the sum function will return a float. Does that make sense? In the second example, the second overload is about the start argument. So you can pass this optional start keyword argument to the sum to say that uh, the sum should start with this other value instead of zero. And then in this case, the return type is a union of the type of the iterable elements and the type of the start, right? So it's, it's not too difficult, but it's, it kind of gets a little bit complicated. This is an example that actually runs and go and, and my, my pie accepts it, my charm accepts it. So what you see here is two overloads, and then the third definition of sum is the actual implementation. You can see the actual implementation, I don't need to put type hints because the type hints are already in the overloads, okay? <clears throat> um, now, here's the thing. The pro there's a kind of a cognitive dissonance, you know? kind of a, a, mind, a mental mismatch between the way Python has always been, right, as a dynamically typed language. We have functions that are extremely flexible, like for instance, the max function, right? So the max function, you can call it with one iterable argument, or you can call it with several arguments, and then you return the maximum value of those arguments. In the first case, it will return the maximum value yielded by the iterable. And you can also pass a key, which is a function that will be used to sort the argument, the, the, the elements, and the default, which is uh, the value that should be returned when, if the iterable is empty, right? So it, it's not too difficult to explain that, you know. In, in, I, I never had any problem using max, using max, you know. Like the simple case is simple. You pass it an iterable or you pass several arguments and returns. And then there's some details. Okay, this is the whole documentation for max. And then I started uh, studying type shed. So type shed is a, pro a project inside the Python organization on GitHub that has type hints for the standard library because the standard library in Python is not annotated. But the, the, the uh, PEP 484 that defined type hints, they created a, a, a file format called py, uh, PYI, which is kind of a .hc file. The uh, PYY files, are called a stud file, is a file that has only declarations, only the function signatures, for instance, right? And that's used by PyCharm, MyPy, and other type checkers to uh, know about the types that are used in the standard library. And other projects, like requests, for instance, requests that doesn't come with type means either, but, but on type chat, they have type means for requests. Uh, so there was a, I, I started studying type shed and contributing, and, and there's a bug, a bug issue there. It's still open actually, but I, I've been working, I, I, I've done already one pull request to fix part of the problem, and I'm about to do the second one. So the, the bug request was that somebody discovered that the max definition on type on type hints did not prevent the case when the iterable was had, had a bunch of numbers, but something like a none inside. Or if one of the arguments, if you call max with several arguments, if one of them is none, or if it's anything that doesn't that cannot be compared, then it blows up. 
at runtime. We know Python does that. But the, the, the user was surprised that 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 uh, uh, MyPy or PyCharm weren't able to tell him that he was doing something wrong with the with using maps, with passing a list that wasn't numbers. So in order to solve this problem, okay, first of all. This is the type hints that are in, on type chat right now for Max. And it's pretty complicated, right? But it says basically that Max can use the first overload says several arguments of type T, and then it returns a type T. But type T on type chat is related to any. Anything can be a type, a, a type T. So any object, in fact, an instance of the object class is uh, accepted. Here. But it doesn't work because objects cannot be uh, compared in terms of one object instance. I mean, the actual object class, you know, you can't compare one object instance to another because they don't implement the less than method. They don't implement any of the comparison methods except uh, equals. Anyway, so there's a, already a complicated type definition there, and it doesn't solve the problem that the user reported. Then I started studying how to solve this problem, and I'm gonna show the solution. So what I'm saying here is that type hints are great, they can solve problems, but they also introduce complexity, and they don't solve all problems, okay? Now let's talk about some recent developments that are good to know. The first thing that I think is very positive is starting with Python 3.9, the built-in collections like list, dict, and so on are changed to accept square brackets so that you can use them in declarations, okay? And if you are using Python 3.8 and 3.7, you can already use this, uh, like this example here. What, what is the, what's new about this example? The last type hint here, where it says dict, lowercase dict with a D, this doesn't work on Python 3.8 unless you import from future. But when you, unless you, you do from the other future import annotations. In Python 3.9, this will work. So you will be able to use the simple lowercase list, set, dict, frozen set in annotations with square brackets for generics. So that's great because it's going to reduce the need to import things from the typing module. Uh, another thing that I think is really important and that happened already in Python 3.8 is the approval of PEP 544. You know, I think my reaction to typing could would have been better, my initial reaction, if this idea of protocols was already part of the proposal since the start. But it's okay, it took two years, but now we have it since Python 3.8, and this is great. So PEP, uh, PEP, 4, 4, PEP 544, Define this idea, defines this idea of protocols which allow structural subtyping, also known as static duct typing. I don't know how many people in the audience and I have used Go and like Go, I like Go. But anyway, what Go has is already this structural subtyping. So one example that I like to, when I talk to people about duct typing, I like to talk about the a simple function like double, right? Double is a, a function like double that you see in the screen, super powerful because you can pass not only a number, but you can also pass a string, and then you have to have this, the string duplicated, or you can pass any, 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 uh, sequence type in Python, uh, a list or a tuple, and then you get as a result the list duplicated or the tuple duplicated, right? 
Uh, anyway, this is powerful, but how do you represent that with static typing? You know? uh, because there is no common ancestor to all the types that N can have. Right? If, you, if you say N is an object, then that's too general. It doesn't help anything, anybody, right? Because you can pass anything, and then, but if you pass something that doesn't support the multiplication, it blows up. So what is the type hint? Before Python 5.4, there was no way to, there was no useful way to annotate this function. You could say it's a, uh, n is a float, okay? But then you're limiting the use, okay? But now you can do this. It's a little bit complicated, but I'm going to explain. So the idea is uh, focus on this class definition. The class definition that I have there is repeatable. It uh, is a subclass of protocol. So protocol is a special class that exists in the typing module. And when I create a subclass of protocol, I am saying, I'm telling the type checker, this is going to be a standard protocol in my system that you can type check. And the protocol is called repeatable. And in order to implement this protocol, an object that has to implement the Dunderbull method. Okay? And in this case, what I'm saying here is the Dunderbull method is going to accept a self, or the self is of type T. And the other is an integer. The other operand should be, should be an integer. And the return type should be at the same type of, of self. OK? So, and those uh, ellipses there, the three periods at the end, they are part of the sentence, OK? Python recognizes that as a token. The, the Python parses understands that as an ellipsis object. And you're going to start seeing a lot of that in Python code because it's using declarations. Okay, so I'm not omitting anything. This is a complete co code listing that works and that uh, MyPy accepts and Python accepts and it works. Okay, so you don't give the implementation. You put three dots instead of the implementation. Okay. The second thing, that the next thing that I need to do is I need to declare a type bar and say that, so I have this type bar called RT and it's bound by the repeatable protocol. So what I'm saying is that objects that are, objects that during type checking are bound to the RT variable must implement repeatable, okay? And so finally, I can annotate double like that. Double is a function that takes an N argument that must be something that implements repeat repeatable, and it will return some the same uh, something of the same type. Does that make sense? I hope it makes sense. Anyway. I think this is awesome. This is great. And this is what actually made me feel at peace with type hinting in Python. Because this allows us to express the dynamic, the duck typing nature of Python. Okay. Uh, another example. And so my first, I guess my first relevant contribution to type shed is a new protocol. In the end, we didn't call it comparable. We called it uh, uh, support less than. Uh, uh, anyway, but let's talk. Let's call it comparable for now. So comparable is a protocol that says a thing that is comparable in Python. So support less than is better. But let's anyway. A thing that's comparable in Python is something that supports the Dunder LT method. The Dunder LT method is the one that implements the less than operator. And I, I, I discovered through research that all the sorting, everything in Python that uses sorting 
only uses the less than operator. This is all it takes to, 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 to do it. This is all that the standard library of Python uses to sort elements, is the less than operator. So if something implements the less than operator, then I can use this object in a, in a function like the top. What does top do? Top is similar to max. Top is, I, I give you a, a, a series of, a, an iterable of elements and a length, let's say three, and it will give me the top three elements of the list, okay? So what I'm saying here is that the definition below says, series must be an iterable of something that is comparable, and then it returns a list of things of the same comparable type, okay? Now, <laughs> this is what I'm, I started making contributions to TypeShed, and this is my biggest contribution. It has, uh, I dis discussed with the maintainers, they accepted the idea, I'm, I now just need to submit it, and I'm about to do it, and probably going to do it today or tomorrow. So this is a, a series of six overloads for the max function to, to solve that bug that I described before, okay? And it's, it's you know, I actually wrote, uh, the max function in Python is written in C. I, I rewrote re it in Python. My implementation in Python is shorter than those type definitions. So there's a huge overhead. Okay. And just to zoom in, this is insane. I won't explain this. I actually showed this to Dave Beasley. Dave Beasley said, asked me if it was a April Fool's joke. Okay, so let's wrap up. There are benefits of type hints because they document function signatures. They support the IDE for better code completion and refactoring. They allow finding bugs before running the program. They, auto, they can help automate object serialization and deserialization. And they are optional, which avoid the problem of diminishing returns. Statically typed languages with very sophisticated type system often present their, their users with a problem that they can't express something in the type system and the compiler just won't compile. So there's no way to debug. There's no way to, uh, to use, you know, this does work with the, the, the debugger. There's no way to, to use print statements because the code just, you know, the, the, the language just refuses to run the code because it's not properly annotated. This is the problem with static, traditional statically typed languages. And when the type system is very sophisticated, it's more expressive, so it's good because it's more expressive, but it also becomes more complicated. So I have friends of mine, for instance, that are like a Rust evangelists that keep telling me, oh yeah, Rust is great, but you know, the other day, I spent three hours trying to understand a compiler error. And there's no way to try and, you know, write print statements, explore the problem. You just need to understand what the, the type checker is complaining about. So we don't have this problem. It's great because if you can't annotate something, just don't annotate. You use testing as usual and make sure that the tests that you, you know, the cases that you can envision pass and put it in production. Okay. okay, there is a cost. So one cost is, you know, some people are unhappy. Uh, uh, they basically tweeted this example, you know, uh, there's a lot of stuff to study, right? Look at the PEPs. There's already 17 PEPs about typing in Python. It's a lot of stuff. So there's a, the downsides are there's an effort to learn a whole, a, a whole new set of abstractions. There is, of course, the effort to to write uh, type hints. Uh, the support is really great only in recent versions of Python, although it's possible to use in Python 2.7 with comments. And people have been saying emphatically, 
that if you have a Python 2.7 code base, a very good thing that you can do to help with migration to Python 3 is to start using type hints with type comments. And there's also a slight delay in, pro pro in program startup because of importing the type hints, but I don't think this is very important. The the, so there's the cost and the benefits. The benefits grow when the code base is large and the team is made of professional software developers. Okay. Now, people can say, what are you talking about? Of course, we are all pro professional software developers. Well, I may be, you may be, but not everybody that uses Python are professional software developers. Some of them are biology postdocs. Some of them are astronomers. Some of them are <coughs> investment uh, bankers. You know, some of them are kids learn to program, learning to program. And so for these people, I think the, the cost of learning platforms may be too high and maybe it's not worthwhile. And the benefit is not so great because when you're writing short snippets of code, <coughs> platforms don't give you so much benefit, okay? There's a guy that I quote at the end, has, he wrote, Bernard Gabor said, if you invest in automated tests, you should invest in type things. Not everybody invests in automated tests, and not everybody that don't use automated tests are um, wrong. Okay? In some contexts, automated tests, automated tests uh, are a cost that, the, that is not justified. Okay? So will Python become a set with type language? No, it will never become that. Python is now a gradually typed language. What is the runtime effect of type things? None. There is no validation at all, right? I can say that my function requires an argument of float, but at runtime I can pass a string and it will just behave as usual. Okay. There's uh, a few things in the standard library use. Uh, type hints at import time when a module is loaded, but at runtime, I, I've never, I'm not, I'm not seen anything using that. Should everyone use type hints? No, I've already said why. Okay, uh, I think uh, the cost benefit analysis is not the same for everybody that uses Python. We have a very diverse community, and that's great. And so, we should stop saying that if, if you don't use type hints, you're wrong or you are in the normal journey, okay? Some references, that's the, the uh, best blog post, post that I found. I, uh, I've already written, uh, well, the, the, the real Python folks have a good tutorial about that. I've already written 60 pages about type hints in, in the second edition of the Python. I think some of them will be available in the early release at the writing learning platform in, a, in one or two weeks. I'll keep, I will tell everybody about that on Twitter when it happens. Okay, so that's it for now. Thank you, Sean, and I'm open for questions. Sorry? Yes, I stopped sharing my slides. The slides? Thank you, thank you so much. Yes. So maybe we can go Great. over some of the questions if we have the time. Okay. Oh, we do. <laughs> All right. So let's see what we're seeing there. Okay, our first question is from um, our um, guest from our India. Guest? No, this is our special guest, Jenny. Yeah. yeah. So this is really cool. I'm actually wondering what time is in India right now. And his question is, on what scenario does type hints give you an advantage? Do you recommend them in a smaller code base or a large code base? Like the one they did in Dropbox code base. Yes. Very good question. Thank you very much. Yeah. So, uh, like I said, there is a, uh, a cost. Everything has costs and benefits, right? Uh, and... Uh, so I think you have to you have to analyze. 
And I think certainly as the size of a code base grows, type hints become more and more interesting. You know, and so it's not a coincidence that the 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 the, 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 the companies I think that have invested more on type hints uh, are Google, Dropbox, and Facebook. Each of these three companies, they don't sell tools. Of course, you know, uh, JetBrains invests in type hints because it's good for them, you know, to make uh, pie chart work better. But those other three companies, they don't sell tools, but they have invested in creating their own type checkers, you know? Uh, MyPy was developed, I started outside of Dropbox, but Guido hired the creator of MyPy to work with him at Dropbox. And, uh, and most of the, I think most of the commits in Dropbox, in, in MyPy, in historically now, are from people that work for Dropbox. And, and so Facebook also has a type checker of their own. And uh, Lucas Langa, who is very important, in the type means movement in Python is the author of some of the important apps, works for, for Facebook. And I know that uh, uh, Google also has a, a type checker. Alex Martelli is, uh, is working, going to be a uh, tech reporter for a uh, tech edition of my book. He was a tech reporter in the first edition. And he told me that he has used his team works with the Google Type Checker every day and they love it. And, and for them, in, in fact, for, at least for Dropbox and Google, then uh, one of the biggest benefits that they have seen, not only is making it easier to understand a huge code base of millions of lines of code in their case, but also make it easier to get the code base from Python 2 to Python 3. So they see this as a huge benefit. Uh, anybody that has done this conversion process knows that the biggest problem is the problem of strings that in Python 2 we use for text and bytes, and in Python 3 they were separated. And with type hints, that allows you to catch a lot of those bugs that are very subtle. So uh, I think, depend so co of course, the size of the code base is a very good uh, variable that you have to take into account, but there are other variables. Like I said, if you if your team is a team of people who make a living coding, you know, coding is my job, then it's okay for these people to learn type hints, to, to you know the cost investment of learning a type system, generics, covariance, lots of concepts is worthwhile for them. But if you are working with physics, you know, if you have a team of physicists, you know, that they don't do coding all the time. That's not their job, right? They, they do physics experiments and they write physics papers. So for them, it may not be worthwhile at all, okay? And in particular, I think, you know, Python is, a, is very widely used as a, a language to teach programming, and I think it's a great language to teach programming. But please, people, never, never teach programming in Python. You know? I've, I've taught uh, people to program in Java, and it was just a mess trying to explain the typing together with the algorithms and everything else, you know? So, Please, let's not do that. This is just a terrible idea. That's great advice. Thank you so much. So maybe we can go for the next question. By the way, you got this from Pico, Deutschland, the bottle. The bottle. Yeah, no, I, I don't remember. It's a, it's a IBM. <laughs> yeah, I have the same. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. So the next question um, is, which type checker would you recommend to you? Well, first I want to send a virtual hug to Jürgen. Jürgen is one of the friends that I made in Berlin last year. It's great to see you here, Jürgen. So which type checker? Uh, I am using MyPy, 
because uh, I think it's the more, it's kind of more standard one, okay? Uh, because there's more investment uh, in, in it, and, uh, and it's, it's, it's pretty much the reference uh, type checker. I guess I, I would probably say that the, probably the most popular type checker is the one that's embedded in PyCharm. Okay. Uh, Thank you, Lisa. So, uh, yes. Uh, so all of, a lot of the squiggles and the, the, the suggestions that PyCharm is giving you today, it's leveraging their own type checker and the work of the community in projects like type, type shed and other projects that have type things. But MyPy, I think, is uh, by far the more, uh, the most uh, popular one. But I have to call attention to the GitHub one, uh, sorry, the Google one. I think it's called. Uh, I forgot. It, I forgot if it's Py Py Types or Py Type. One of the two. Anyway, Py Type or Py Types. I don't know if it has the S at the end or not. I forgot. But anyway, this is a very interesting project because it has a different kind of, of approach. The approach of of Py Types from from Google is to work with code that is not annotated at all. And uh, and MyPy is not for that. MyPy just ignores code that's not annotated. You know, even if, if you have a, a module with several functions with annotations, if you have a function in the middle of the module with no annotation, MyPy won't even look at it. It will just skip to the next one. Okay. That's a great but, uh, remark. <laughs> Actually, no. Uh, sorry, I'm just thinking that. This is so uh, good for the next question that we have um, right now about annotations. So uh, Jürgen is also asking, um, which minimum Python version would you recommend when you want to convert a project to use type annotation and enjoy using type annotation? So what would you say? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I would probably enjoy type annotations. We will probably enjoy type annotations more in Python 3.9. Uh, I am not enjoying it right now because uh, my Pi is not working with Python 3.9 correctly yet. And if there is no use to put annotations if you don't have a type checker that can uh, check your code. So I, for the book, I'm still using Python 3.8, but I think Python 3.9 is going to be great because it, uh, because, it don't, uh, because of the thing that I mentioned that we'll be able to use lists and tuple and zip in our annotations with the square brackets for generics. Uh, and uh, I, I, in, in Pack 484, right in the beginning, they already had the comment syntax for using Python 2.7. And I thought that was kind of horrible, but I am now convinced because of the talks that I've seen by people from Dropbox and, and Google in my conversation with uh, Alex Mapegni also, that it's a very good investment to annotate Python 2.7 code. Uh, to make it, because the, the, the syntax, the comment syntax works, works in Python 2.7 and Python 3. And, and the type checkers, all of them understand both the, the, the comment syntax. So I think that's a good strategy. If you have still a Python 2.7 code base, you should start using annotations because it's going to make it easier to migrate to Python. I agree. So let's take the best out of that world into the next one as well. So we have another question. Uh, hi, Luciano. Thanks for the talk and fresh contributions. Type things extend the length of some lines of code, possibly broken into two plus lines, not so easily scannable web work. All right. And the little sign that you have to return, right? <laughs> Saying it doesn't appeal to me visually. I would prefer a single character for a single action. What's your opinion on that? All right. Well, I'm I, again. I have to send a bit for her to Miro as well because he is another one that I met in Berlin last year and we became friends. And actually. Uh, this is a world first. He is actually already a, 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 a technical reviewer of the book. 
for his videos. And his, oh, shout out to Mio for that. That's yes. really great. I am so, very happy to see him here today as well. So really, cheers to yeah. you. Thanks for joining. Um, so, yeah, so. Yeah, so let me answer these questions. Uh, yeah. I agree that, you know, sometimes the line becomes long. Uh, uh, black has a way of, of breaking these lines. Uh, I have, I, I don't think I have an example. Oops. I think my connection. We can hear you properly. Yeah. We hear you good. No, you I don't know if can, you can no. hear us, but we can hear you good. We're able to hear you. Hello. All right. We can hear you. Am I we back? We can hear you. Okay. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. There was you a. Oh. It was frozen for a few seconds. Okay. So black has a way of doing that, which it opens the parentheses and then uh, starts putting the type, the 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 argument one below the other, and then. At the end, it closes the parentheses, indented at the same line, at the same column as the start of the function, and then puts the the arrow. Uh, I, I like this the, this formatting that Black does. In the book, I haven't used it most a lot of the time because of, because it takes a lot of vertical space, which is limited in book listings. So sometimes I I like put the first argument in the first line. And put the return type together with the, you know, to get the, the end. And I just break it in two. So in the book, you will see that the, I don't use a very consistent format because my priority is to you know make the code fit in a page that is small. But uh, yeah, I, I I I actually like the arrow. You know, I like it. I like it visually. Uh, I like the fact that we have adopted the same. Uh, argument column type order that is from Pascal because I like to say that I am so old that I actually lived when there was a language war between Pascal and C and of course C won but now I see languages like Go has a lot of influence of, in, of Pascal and Go there is a lot of influence and I like that we adopted the same ordering which I think makes more sense than the C style of type uh, and then the name of the thing. Uh, because, you know, how do you read it? You, you read, you know, you, you read, uh, you know, I don't know, I don't know. Name is a string. Name, a string. You know, instead of string, name. It's just silly because it's more important the name, right, of the thing, yeah. and not the type. Uh, anyway. So I think I'm not I'm, I'm not I'm not unhappy I'm not unhappy about this syntax. Uh, there is a new improve. There's something that's coming up, uh, but I don't think it's gonna be in Python 3.9 because it wasn't approved in time with that. But in Python 3.10, we are going to be used, able to use union using the vertical bar, the pipe operator. So instead of writing union square bracket string int, we're going to say this string uh, pipe int. There are other languages that have to see this. That's, that's, so that's nice. That's really cool. And there's a lot, a lot of people asking about your next book, so a lot of people are looking forward. That's right. <laughs> so, for example, I'm you're working. just saying super interesting and entertaining talk. Looking forward so much to the second edition of Green Python. We are definitely looking also forward working, as yeah. well. Yeah. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm working very hard to have it done so that it's gonna be available at the end of the year or next year. Thank you so much. I still have so much to learn. I just feel the same way. Yeah, hearing this <laughs> everything that you're saying right now is just yeah, please continue thank, <laughs> doing what you're doing. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Anastasia. Here. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, we have lots of comments, really just starting out for you. Um, here, then, uh, yeah, Anastasia, yeah. Maria, um, then Jürgen again, and Felvan. So we're all very glad to have you here. This, um, I Right now, I have to think um, also a little bit about typing on this, um, yeah, and another 
going to another topic, I was also thinking about this um, talk that I heard from Nilo in Berlin or in Munich last year about the, your name is invalid. And I felt so identified <laughs> with that because I have a typical invalid name. Like, I am, uh, yeah, in some documents I have like two names, four names, like you choose it, and then sometimes like incomplete. Well, you probably also know about that, and this makes me think I about I think uh, uh, it's a problem also in Brazil, we have so many names. I don't know if it's, your name is only Luciano Ramalho, but mine is like Laisa, blah, 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 blah. All right. Yeah, no, I have, I have this problem. I have four ah, names. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> And so it doesn't. Yeah, it, it doesn't fit a lot of forms. It's a. It's a. It's. It's a. I can't do. I. I've never been able to do uh, online check-in on an international flight ever, because yeah, the true. system just can't make the the name fit. It, it cannot. So I have to go. Right? Yeah, I have to go. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's really cool. Talking about check-ins, though. You might be wondering why Pi Ladies uh, didn't show around for a couple of weeks before, and we were missing uh, one very important member of our community. Also, on that note, everyone who is from the Pi Ladies community in Munich, please also cheer, um, yeah, cheers to you. Drop us a line in the comments. We're very happy to see you here. And well, we were missing Laisa for a couple of uh, weeks. Much months there. So. Before answering that, I have a final question for you, Luciano. I did want to get on this, but I want to talk a little bit how is the situation in Brazil right now. Uh, just like I'm a Brazilian, and I know that there is being a hard time right now in Brazil, uh, in the political scenario, in the economical scenario, and I think you are also aware, but I'm not there right now, so I cannot say what's happening. Could you like? Shed a light a little bit. How is the situation right now, especially with the C the C virus? Uh, I don't. I don't. Uh, it's it's very bad. You know, people don't realize because there, there is no end in sight. You know, our curve is still exponential growth. Uh, you know. Uh, and I, I don't know, we have a president who is completely stupid and irresponsible. And we don't have a health minister. Right now there's a general, and this general appointed other military. They have medical doctors in the army, but they don't invite any medical doctors, not even from the army. So there's just a bunch of generals and colonels doing what the President wants them to do. So it's insane. It's absurd. I don't know. It's just uh, it's just very sad. I am trying to uh, to be really honest with you guys. About two months ago, when the you know the wow. lockdown started, I, I was really depressed. I couldn't work. I, I, I came here every day and I was just you know staring at the city. I didn't know what to do. And uh, I. I was very, I, I was very scared because I have a heart condition, and uh, but of course I am very privileged, you know. Uh, the problem is that a lot of people can't avoid; it. they have to go to work, they have to take the subway. The subway is too crowded. Yeah. I don't know. I just, uh, it's very sad. I don't know. What you think? I started. Uh, I decided that I needed to not think too much about that because it was driving me crazy, and so I decided to focus on the book and focus on uh, on Tokus. Tokus is my employer. They are a great company, and they are uh, supporting uh, everybody as best as they can. Everybody is working from home at Tokus. Uh, they, they they've authorized. People, employees to go to the office and, and, and take stuff to take home. Like, for instance, you have a big monitor in the office, you can take it home. You have a good chair in the office, you can take it home. You know, just write on a spreadsheet what you're taking home. So they're, they're doing uh, as best as they can. And uh, we are seeing clients, uh, I can't name the, the name of the client, but I have, we have a client that told us that they have already decided that even when the crisis is, 
pandemic is over, they don't intend to fire people. They are an e-commerce company, they, they have a lot of demand, but they don't want two thirds of the employees to come back to the office. They decided that they will permanently downsize the physical office. You know, people, so what they're saying is two thirds of the people that are developers, designers, you know, people like us are going to be working from, from home forever. That's, so I think it's sure. really like a privileged time for developers that are able to work from home and keep at the work like yes. the level. But my heart also goes with the the whole population that cannot do that. It thoroughly influences everybody. It's not uh, that we yes. are in our own world. It doesn't happen. We we have yeah. friends. We have family. We have people in different classes. Yeah, so that's right. And yeah, so thank you so much for sharing our thoughts or our good energies with you. We really hope that we all uh, make it as a whole and as with so little losses as possible out of this thing. Um, thank you so much. Stay safe. And uh, we, ho we hope that everything improves soon and that it all works out. And um, I also want to to make a little announcement right now. We are, uh, thank you Alex for joining in and telling this to the audience as well. Um, we're having a little bit of a battery shortage right now. We're at 1%. So we really hope we're gonna make the, the best out of this. We're gonna be with you until the battery leaves you. <laughs> if the battery leaves us, we still right. help you, we still so, safe. Sorry, <laughs> if you're, if you're gone for a little bit, you know why. But yeah, so, Thank you so much for, for uh, to everyone who's joining today. Thank you, thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Luciano. That's right. Thank yeah. you, Maria. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you, Inga. That's right. We're so thank happy you, to Anton. have you. Yeah, big shout out again to Anton. Thank you so much. And now, in, the, in case you want to still be here, hang out with us and with these superstars that we had for speakers tonight, we're gonna open a Skype session now, so you can join in in the Skype in the Skype session that we're on the background already, yes. um, trying to yeah, uh, trying to organize all of this for you. So now you can join in. We will post the link right now on the chat, so that you can just join in, Please hang out. Yeah. Um, don't be scared. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So I guess this. Is Thank you so much. Oh, oh, wait a minute. Do you still want to tell us where you oh were in the last week? Battery is dead. <laughs> we are going to make this until the battery is really dead. In the so. chat, we're going to talk about it, those people. <laughs> so thank you so much. And I think that's it. So namaste. All right. So, okay, everyone. I hope we see you now in the Skype session. And if not, goodbye to you. Stay at home if you can. Please, please stay at home and stay safe as much as you can and that's right we hope to see you healthy soon <laughs> big hug Bye. Bye. Bye.